So on behalf of the Schiller Institute and its chairperson and founder, Helga Zeppler-Rouche, I appreciate and thank uh, the Most Reverend John C. Fester for this interview and time um, speaking with us. My name is Clarette Carl Ferguson. I'm with the Schiller Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. And our interview occurs in a very charged and threatening world uh, strategic environment where so much threatens the existence of our one humanity. I want to point out that um, following His Holiness Pope Francis's offer to host peace negotiations without preconditions among all the parties warring in the Ukraine, that the Schiller Institute's leader and founder, Mrs. LaRouche, uh, initiated a call worldwide to governments, to religious and organizational leaders, and people all over the world to support this offer and to mobilize with the Schiller Institute to have it urgently adopted and acted upon. So who is uh, His Excellency Archbishop John C. Wester? He's a very well-known and outspoken leader who has addressed the necessity of eliminating nuclear weapons he is an advocate of disarmament. Notably, in 2022, His Excellency was chosen and delivered the homily at the United Nations Evening Prayer Service. He has participated in numerous interfaith activities and publicly promotes peaceful coexistence and cooperation among all faiths. He supports His Holiness Pope Francis's offer to negotiate a peaceful end to the hostilities in and around Ukraine. Thank you, Your Excellency, for giving us this time. And I want to start with my first question. According to uh, coverage of Pope Francis, African tour in the French journal Le Monde, uh, His Holiness reiterated his willingness to host these peace negotiations. What message do you have for leaders who desire world peace, but, but whose voices we have yet to hear? Thank you very much, Claude, for your very thoughtful question and your kind introduction. Um, of course, my my thoughts on, the, on this would be similar to so many of us around the world, really, what message we would have to our world leaders. And I think that message would be um, to really be committed to peace. Peace is not something that just the absence of war or just the absence of conflict, but peace is something that we have to strive to attain. It's, it's a, a way of being with one another. Uh, scriptures talks about right relationships in both testaments we we read about right relationships. And, and so really God established us to be in right relationship with, with God, with one another, and with our common home, the earth, Mother Earth. And so uh, peace really could be defined, I think, that way, by being in right relationship with God, with one another, and with our environment. And really sin or conflict or war could be defined as fragmentation, of being divided, of being cut off of being separate from. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> I think our world leaders need to see that peace really is the goal. Uh, you know, there are so many um, uh, factors that are involved in war, uh, but it, it, you, I think they can pretty much be boiled down to, uh, you know, selfishness, uh, narcissism, greed, uh, the, the wanting to control, wanting to have power. Uh, these are the things that start wars and, 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 uh, and and attacks and such as this. And so I think that we need to just really see that peace is the opposite of all that. And we have to encourage our world leaders uh, in this regard. You know, really, um, when you look at the geopolitical level worldwide, it's really no different than the schoolyard or the workplace or any uh, out on the street where we confront one another. 
it's just a bigger, more players and, and more powerful players and, and with the capacity, sadly, to do immense destruction to our civilization. And so I think that the basic principles of, of human decency apply here, you know. Uh, Pope Francis, as you said, is, is uh, willing to serve as a, an, a, an arbiter, as some, as a place where sides can come together, particularly Russia and Ukraine, to talk about and to converse and to seek peace and nego to negotiate a peace, a, an enduring and lasting and just peace. And, uh, and so the, Pope Francis knows what dialogue is all about. He's quoted again and again in his encyclicals and apostolic exhortations that we have to dialogue with one another. We have to converse with one another. One of the key elements of that is, of course, to listen. Uh, the Pope says to us bishops, for example, yes, a bishop has the office of teaching. He must be a teacher of the faith. But a good teacher listens first. And so I think that, you know, the peace table uh, should... Uh, include a lot of silence, a lot of, 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 of an atmosphere in which people can listen to one another. Not listening to, to defeat, not listening to get the better advantage of, not listening so I can hear a chink in your armor, but listening so that I can learn from you and then respond on both sides. And this, this builds a relationship, a right relationship in which the, the different sides can come together. Now, I know this is not easy, and I know some people will say, well, this is just a fantasy world, or you're just dreaming, you're being naive. But really, as we say, in the, and we talk about nuclear disarmament, who really is naive? You know, uh, those people who insist on, on, on doing things the way we've always done them, world wars, uh, in regional wars, things of this nature, or to embark on a new path, the path of peace, so it would, these would be some of the points that I would like to share with world leaders uh, if I had the chance for them to, to really see that this is in, in the people's best interest. One of the main uh, aspects of our Catholic social teaching is the common good. Too often, uh, world leaders think only of their good or their power or their uh, control or their country's power, their country's control. We have to think of the common good. What is good for all people, the, both the world leader and the other countries? So these are some of the thoughts that come to my mind. I, I know there are others, but I think uh, these are some of the uh, important considerations if we're going to have a, a lasting peace in our world someday. Well, it's very interesting that you address those two features because later in our questions, uh, that comes up again. Uh, this being in right relationships and thinking of the common good. Um, so thank you for that. And I want to, my next question actually uh, deals with the Vietnam War era. Uh, at that time, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. understood that he risked being criticized, attacked, and isolated and worse for speaking out publicly against the war um, as an expression of his own conscience and faith. Do you have thoughts on the necessity of religious leaders following Dr. King's example today? Yes, I think uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of my heroes. He, and he's one of the people you may remember that Pope Francis singled out when he talked to the joint sessions of Congress. We were so proud of, of, of our Holy Father on that particular uh, speech that he gave, and we're so happy that of the four people he, he chose Martin Luther King as one of the great heroes of our country, and really one of the great heroes of, of the world and of all time as an advocate for peace and racial justice, as somebody who, whose very life and teachings showed that, that peace is possible, that we can make progress uh, peaceably without uh, violence, that, we, that is, it is something that's possible. And of course, uh, he gave his very life for that cause. And he is a real martyr and a prophet and, and a true teacher. Uh, I think that the, um, to me, as religious leaders, what Dr. King showed is that what we do is grounded in scripture. It's grounded in the word, the word of God, that it's grounded in our relationship with God and with one another, as you just said, this right relationship. So, um, I think that, yes, we do take risks sometimes when we speak out publicly in the public square, 
but we take the risk because it's mandated by by God. For us Christians, it's mandated by Christ or for by Allah or Adonai or depending on your, your faith tradition. But the point is, it is God who motivates us, God who calls us. So we're not speaking our our truth or our word. As religious leaders, we're speaking God. We're prompted by the word of God. And that's what Dr. King was prompted by, the word of God. And so uh, that's what gives us our strength. And that's what gives us the ability to take risks. Hopefully, uh, you know, we, we pray that these risks don't lead to violence, as sadly it did for Dr. King and others. But uh, nonetheless, we take the risk knowing that, you know, God is our guide and our protector and knowing that we're doing it for the right reasons and that we're doing it to help and to serve humanity, not for our own glory, our own self-aggrandizement, but for doing it for, for the good of others, for the good of the church, for the good of, of the, the common good, as we say. So I think this is what motivates us and what gives us the confidence to, to move ahead as religious leaders. We don't speak about, you know, I, I, uh, when we, for example, we have here in New Mexico, we have three Catholic bishops in New Mexico, we have our Catholic bishops conference, and our, our state legislature is in session now. So we speak up on those things that we believe are related to, to so Catholic social teaching for us, because Catholic bishops, those things that we believe are rooted in the scripture, uh, the sanctity of life, the dignity of worker, the worker, and the dignity of work, and the common good, etc., and so we don't speak up on other things. We don't take a, a stand on things that don't somehow or other connect to those areas. So I think that's an important, sometimes people will say, well, you just go back to your church and say your prayers, your temple or your mosque and leave us alone. But that's not, the, that's not what faith is all about. We're not called to live in a bubble. We're called to live in this world, in this society, and to be leavened in the world and to help the world to, to hear the word of God believing strongly that in hearing and, and responding to it, it will bring peace, it will bring, it will bring about the common good. So these are our, our beliefs. We do it, you know, uh, we have a right to do it, thanks be to God in the United States of America, to speak our truth in the public square, and then people listen and then go to the voting booth. So we're not a theocracy, you know, we don't mandate what people do as religious leaders, but rather we, we try to, we, we have gentle persuasion, we, we preach the word, speak the truth as best we can, and pray that the word God will work in that, in that truth. That's, that's very important. Um, I just would like to interject here that, um, and though I think I mentioned it in one of our discussions, that um, one of the ways that we're trying to reach out to a broad uh, segment of the world population is by initiating something called the coincidence of opposites, which was an idea um, that derived from uh, Nicholas of Cusa, who was a cardinal in the 15th century. And that's something Mrs. LaRouche has uh, initiated also, which in time, hopefully we'll get to study more about how that's been working in our work internationally. Um, the other side of that is the question that I'm going to ask you now, which uh, brought an end to the 30 years war. And that's about the principle of, of Westphalia, um, the advantage of the other. That was the foundation of that notion, which, you know, basically says, stop finger pointing. We're not going to be like the kids on the uh, playground and kick each other and pull each other's hair and point the finger at who started what, but rather um, how can we, you know, find an end not only to our current hostilities, um, but how do we establish a lasting peace to avert future wars? And this was one of the ideas that uh, we based our work on is the advantage of the other, how to get the other side to believe that they are inherently good and we have to work together. So what what do you think about that? Well, I think that you're hitting upon something that's very, very important. And you're hitting upon something that actually uh, resonates with us as Christians, and I know so many other world religions as well. 
And that is, you know, I would express it this way in Genesis, God looked at all that God had created and God saw that it was very, very good. Or as my mom used to, mom always told us as children, there's a little bit of good in the worst of us, a little bit of bad in the, in the best of us, so it behooves the rest of us not to talk about any of us. <laughs> so I, I think that this, this principle is so important that you, you, you describe so beautifully, Claret, and that is, is that we, and this gets back to what I said earlier about listening to the other. Part of that, uh, I didn't finish that thought because it was not the part of the subject matter, but what Pope Francis also talks about, not just listening to the other, but listening with the idea that there's goodness in the other, as you say, <laughs> the, the advantage of the other, that there, that, you know, God's creation is good and the people are fundamentally good. I, I had a priest that I was fond of when I was in San, my San Francisco years, and he always said, I always assume the best in everybody until proven otherwise. <laughs> And, it's, and so it's important for us to have that principle, you know, because as you say, you know, and if you think about it on the, neg on the flip side of this, this is precisely what people do when they're going to go to war or when they're going to subject a race of uh, a certain culture, a certain class of people. We demonize them. We dehumanize them. We, we, we use word, for example, I, I, will, I will apply it in the immigration question and, 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 and when we talk about immigrants, you notice people talking about um, hordes coming across the border, a tsunami, you know, we're being attacked by a tsunami. Uh, these, these conjure up ideas of, of locusts and pests and pestilence and, and natural disasters. So we don't look at them, the immigrant as a human being, as a person fleeing persecution and difficulty and economic hardship, et cetera. But we look upon them as, as things, as ob we've, we've objectified them. We've, we've ceased to see them as human. And so this is so critical in, in coming to peace terms and coming away from war. And that is to see the advantage of the other, the goodness of the other, and to see that God's creation is indeed good and, um, and, and to be able to, and this is not easy, this is what's hard, to be willing for me as an individual to say to myself, I may be wrong. I may, I may have stereotyped this person <laughs> and, in, a, in an unjust way because this is what I grew up to believe or this is what I've been taught to believe. But, uh, and so to be able to see what are the prejudices and the bigotries that I've taken on. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've confronted that issue here in New Mexico with systemic racism. And, and we've had prayer services, especially after the murder of George Floyd and others, as tragic uh, instances in our country. And just recently, of course, uh, with Tyrone. So there's all these, all these um, uh, um, difficulties that we have to face by, by recognizing that we've we bought into this narrative that's wrong, this, this, this racism. Remember the South Pacific, you know, you have to teach somebody how to hate. You know, we're not born that way. When mm -hmm. I think we have the lyric two, four, six, or eight. <laughs> you know, that, that we need to see the goodness in the other person to look clearly. I would put it this way as a religious leader. We need to see others the way God sees others. That God looks upon each of his children and sees them as good and, and lovable and loving. And that's what we're called to do. It's not easy, but we're made in the image and likeness of God. God's given us the capacity to do it. And so we've got to really challenge ourselves to see the goodness in each other. Uh, to bring it down to brass tacks, that means, and I've, I've seen articles about this too, saying, you know, I, I hear sometimes people say, oh, well, Russia is terrible for what they're doing to Ukraine. Well, what does that mean? So, you know, Suddenly, gradually, people begin to say, oh, all Russians are, are bad. Now, if you mm -hmm. confront them, they'd say, well, no, I don't believe that. But on an affective level, kind of on a kind of by osmosis, people begin to take this in and they start to say, oh, yeah, all Russians are bad. And so um, we have to be careful. We have to, even when we see people who are hardened criminals, we have to be able to look beyond the surface and say that that person is better than the worst thing he or she has ever done. And to be able to say this is a human being who may be the victim of uh, alcohol fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome or a victim of child abuse uh, as growing up, uh, uh, whatever it may be. So we have to be able to really, and that's not easy because I think instinctively 
we, we have the flight or fight instinct in us as, as human beings. And we, we kind of instantly want to say friend or foe. Do I need to be afraid of you or can I be your friend? And so quite often, once we hit to that, that foe button, boy, that person, we've, we've cut them off. We've categorized them and now it's okay to kill them or whatever. Uh, or to enslave them, or to take advantage of them, or or whatever. So I think, I think that that's a very basic principle that 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 you. I'm so glad that you brought that out because this really gets to the heart of what we what these peace talks and negotiations are all about. To really see the goodness in, in others, to see one another as God sees us. Well, I must confess, even though I was raised in the Catholic Church, um, that that idea, which I initiated in this discussion, actually is part of something that I transmitted to you, and I hope you will examine it. And it's part of what's called the 10 principles for discussing a new security and uh, development architecture, which our founder, Mrs. LaRouche, um, put out as a discussion topic and it's the uh, major principle of the last um, principle out of 10 for which she said she wanted to get the world community to discuss this, this idea, the idea that you just elaborated because she felt that this was probably the origins of how you get um, the world you know, in such a state that it is today. I mean, on so many levels, you have this kind of problem. So I hope you'll go back and look at, <laughs> there's a little click on one of the messages I sent you where you can get access to the 10 principles because that was number 10. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I can't thank you enough for, for pointing me to that. And uh, I think that it, it comes in handy too with our work for nuclear worldwide verifiable nuclear disarmament because those principles that you speak of I think would be very helpful for us as well uh, that we we point to those principles and instead of nuclear arms as as to solve our problems and our differences. And I think that your founder had great insight and uh, enlightenment that we all can benefit from. Thank you. So on my final question, actually it's one other thing that I want to raise, but the final uh, organized question I had was that uh, Pope Francis remarked to the world, hands off of Africa and to the Congolese whom he visited, that they are infinitely more precious than any treasure found in their fruitful soil. And this brought to mind for me the focus of the encyclical Popolorum Progressio of Pope Paul VI, you know, on the topic of development um, being the new name for peace. Do you think the mission to raise the standard of living of all people and nations can provide the basis to durable worldwide peace? Yes, I certainly do. And this is a profound question, a very good one. I think that um, um, the development of all peoples uh, is critically important to peace. Uh, I think poverty obviously is uh, is a great uh, um, Reality. This is the 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 cause of so many wars. You know, uh, whether it be, you know what what do they always say? Follow the money. You know, if you look at all war, sadly, uh, money has a lot to do with it. Wealth has a lot, whether it be oil or mineral rights or water rights or whatever you want to translate that, has a lot to do with our conflict. Instead of sharing the goodness that God has given us, we want to hoard it and control it. So, um, so I think that, you know, remember Pope Paul also said, if you want peace, work for justice. I think that was when he talked to the United Nations. And that was a big bumper sticker in the 60s. I knew, <laughs> and, uh, I go back that far even before that. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a very important point. You know, I, I was in, in, in reading your question, I, it brought to mind a quote of uh, Brian Stevenson, who was quoted by the um, uh, Equal Justice Initiative uh, group. And Brian Stevenson said, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. And so I think that fits into this theme as well, that, uh, that the development of peoples is so critical 
uh, to the peace initiative, that this is getting, what this does is it gets at the root causes. It gets at the root mm-hmm. cause of war and conflict and violence. Uh, it, it gets back to that whole notion that, you know, God meant for us to be in right relationship. When you're right mm-hmm. relationship with other buddy. You know, I, there's a little anecdote that, I, that I'm very fond of. It's a true story. Um, Sister Marilyn Lacey worked in San Francisco Bay Area and helping refugees, asylum seekers, forced immigrants who were coming into the Bay Area, getting them resettled and helping them to get oriented and, and set roots. And so they picked up a, a, a one that was one a woman who's coming in, I think from Bhutan, I forget now, but and she was very hungry. So they fixed a meal for her but she didn't eat. And they say, well, you said you were hungry, but you're not eating. And she said to them, well, where are the others? And she says, sister said, what do you mean? She says, well, uh, we don't eat alone in my, in my culture. We always eat with other people, but we, we never eat alone. And so that was a very telling thing for me, you know, that in, in, deeply ingrained within her is the idea of sharing of solidarity, which is another Catholic mm-hmm. justice uh, theme topic. And, and so, which is the opposite of, of clinging, of hoarding, which starts war. So if we can learn to, to take into account everybody, you know, uh, forced migration is forced because of a lack of sharing, a lack of, mm-hmm. of goods, a lack of whatever, maybe economic stability, jobs. You know, mm-hmm. It's also partly because of persecution and crime and, and, and things like that, drugs and all that too. But so I think that we need to really recognize this is a very important uh, reality that we need to get to the root cause. I remember years ago, they had this, what was that called? That 0.7% project. If we can get all countries, developed countries to share at least 0.7% of their wealth with the whole world, it would help to eradicate poverty. That never, we never came close to that, sadly. Mm-hmm. But this is the kind of, 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 of notion I think that's absolutely critical to get to the root causes. It's one thing to talk about the immediate uh, reality, the precipitating causes of a war, mm-hmm. try to bring peace. But what you just referred to, you know, in the 30 years war, how can we prevent future wars? This is getting, this is one of those archetypal principles, those basic principles that go beyond just this, the, the local uh, regional oh. to help us to see in general, going toward the future, how can we prevent war? And I think this is a very good way to, to, one of the ways to do it is to share the wealth, so to speak, to work with people on how we can help them, not give them a handout, but a hand up, how we can assist people to to use their natural resources for their good. And that brings up another point. A lot of the third world countries are third world countries because they've been victimized Mm -hmm. by first world countries. They've been colonialized and they've gone in years past They've ripped, they've, they've raped the country, they've stolen the, the mineral rights or the goods, et cetera, and then left the people bereft. And um, mm-hmm. so that's another, uh, you know, when you look at the history of this, you see this again and again, instead of sharing and helping everybody to share in the goods, it's been rather a hoarding and a controlling. And this is what gets up, causes war. So this is a very important, I'm so glad you asked this, this, this final question, because it really is an important one. And it leads us to say that we need to look at root causes in our conversations about peace. We have to look at the root causes of war and what are the fundamentals of peace and how can we really live those in such a way that we can finally one day be rid of war in our planet. Thank you. You know, um, I had originally made that my final question and in the interim, there's been this horrible a disaster that hit Turkey and Syria. And I was uh, looking at what, you know, what could be done and what what's going on. I know the head of our organization issued a call also um, to call for uh, uh, getting rid of the sanctions against Syria. And um, I just saw that, um, I think it was Cardinal, uh, Mario Zanari, who's the Papo Nuncio to Syria, was there and overseeing, you know, the uh, humanitarian aid from the church. And he, he said, look, I see a sea of pain here. And, you know, it, it's just so 
horrifying to think that even after rescuing people from the rubble and from you know these two um, earthquake hits that you know now can we keep people alive? Can we make sure that they can rebuild? And you know after I don't know how many years, 11, 12 years of war, now on top of this, those people are suffering even worse uh, and very unjustly, so I, I wanted to find out, you know, if you had more to say about what um, the church is doing and what our viewers and readers um, might do to, you know, try to alleviate the suffering of people there, especially this thing with the sanctions. Mm -hmm. well, that's a very good point, uh, Clarette. And I think that um, you, you bring up several points, and uh, I, I, the, our, from our Catholic perspective, we certainly, Catholic Relief Services is in over 100 countries throughout the world with you know, almost a billion dollar budget per year to help approximately 100 million people throughout the world. So that certainly is a very concrete way, along with the, all the other usual suspects, you know, the Red Cross and all the different agencies that can help uh, but for us, we use Catholic Relief Services because they, they can get in there to the people in Syria and in, and in Turkey and in so many places, you know, often where they are, they, they, they have people on the ground already. Um, but, you know, this really ties into all of those other four questions, if you think about it, especially the last one, because, you know, a lot of the tragedy we saw in Syria, Turkey and surrounding areas, a little bit of Israel and other parts, um, was because of poor construction, which was because of people trying to cut corners, which is trying to make a living, to make money. And, uh, and so, again, if we had a better distribution of goods in our world, people would be less inclined to do those kinds of things. I'm not saying it's a magic wand that will get rid of it. I suppose that's something we human beings have to fight all the time is greed and trying to make more money or whatever. But uh, that's a, a huge portion. You see buildings that were built properly are intact. And the buildings that were not built properly are up to code for whatever reason are not intact. And so over 41,000 people are uh, perished, you know, because of that. So I think that's another area. And here's an area too, where I think uh, this is my own opinion, but I, I think if we, if nations around the world could really invest in the United Nations and really put faith in the United Nations, I know that they, they, the United Nations does have a lot of support, but it doesn't have a fulsome support from, from all of our countries throughout the world, including the United States. There's kind of a, 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 what I perceive to be a, a hesitancy to really trust, to really, you know, for everybody to, to go all in with the United Nations and to talk to one another and to solve some of these world problems. How can, how can we all come together as, as one common human family and help one another. We have technologies and scientific uh, ability and capacity in a lot of our countries to be able to help those other countries and to assist them. But instead, as you say, we have these sanctions based on different realities that have been in place. Look at the sanctions we've had on Cuba for these many decades. And they just are there. They become part of our everyday. We just get inured to them and we don't think about them, but we don't think about the suffering that causes so many people are caused uh, are suffer because of them. And so and to have an urgency of solving them, don't just set up sanctions, but you know, that should be a, a red flag immediately to keep working at solving the problem so we can lift those sanctions and so people can live more freely and, and more fully at the fully human lives that God intends for them to live. So I think all these things are connected, you know, the finances, the economy, the capacities, the infrastructure, the way we get together as a, as a world, these are all connected. We have to be caring for one another. Sadly, you know, I mean, I'm glad that we do help. Uh, USAID, for example, does a lot of good, but those are usually handouts. What we have to do is help people, you know, to really have, give them a hand up and help them to help themselves and give them the capacity and the motivation and the ability to do that. Then they can be on their own feet. And, and, and we all have to, you know, we can all learn from one another. We can all, we all have something we can learn from one another. You know, so I think that's a good question. That tragedy, it's, a, it's an awful thing. 
But as one of the uh, people from, I think it was Turkey said, you know, yes, this is a natural disaster, but it's also a, a, it's a human disaster. It's a human made disaster because of our, our inability to help one another and especially economically. Well, I would like to propose at some point, um, not too far off, that uh, you grant us another uh, discussion time where we can talk about the emerging spirit of Bandung, a Bandung conference from 1955, and this non-aligned, um, not cutting oneself off and not taking sides, but the spirit of Bandung amongst these developing countries to organize a new, more just economic uh, arrangement amongst nations, including the United States, including Russia, including all of the Western powers to come together around development and you know, make that the centerpiece of a new paradigm. That's something that uh, we've been working for in the Schiller Institute. And I hope that in the future, you know, we could discuss that and um, I hopefully get you to read some of the things we've already done in that, in that direction because it's so needed. And it's, you know, like you said, we need a more lasting means by which people can be given the means to lift themselves up and contribute to the world community's needs. I think that that makes all people, uh, you know, gives them a sense of worth and they realize, you know, they are able to, to do something good in the world. And that always, you know, helps to inspire people towards being good for the sake of good. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I, I can see that I have a lot to learn from you, Clarette, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to doing that. And I, I hope we can talk again. And I would like very much to, to pour over these materials and to get back with you again. So thank you for the invitation. And I gladly accept. Thank you. So I think that's the end of our discussion today. And I thank you so much for giving us your time and your thoughts. And hopefully these words will inspire others to get on board with what His Holiness is doing to bring peace to this world, because we do need a miracle. Yes, we do. And <laughs> thank God for Pope Francis. He's doing his best. And so are you. And so are so many others. So together, I think there's a lot of hope. We, 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 I feel a lot of hope.